Hello, I'm Kirk Weiler, and this is Common Core Algebra 2 by eMath Instruction. Today, we'll be working on Unit Number 9, Lesson Number 4, The Discriminant of a Quadratic. Now, in the last lesson, we saw how quadratic equations can have complex roots with non-zero imaginary parts. In other words, they can have roots that have an i in their solutions. We also saw how that tied into the x-intercepts of a parabola and what's known as the discriminant of a quadratic. Today we're going to really dig into that and look at how the discriminant really sort of forces on us the nature and the number of the roots of a quadratic. So let's take a look. All right. The quadratic formula, negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac divided by 2a, does really two things. It solves any equation of this form, whether it has complex solutions or not, and it also finds the x-intercepts of a parabola. All right. But then we have this thing called the discriminant which is the b squared minus 4ac part. You see, the negative b and the 2a, eh, you know, they're there, and they certainly affect the answers. But what's really interesting is what's underneath the square root, because whether that's negative or positive will dictate whether or not we have answers that are purely real or have an imaginary component to them. All right? Now, what we're going to be doing is in this lesson, we're going to be looking at four distinct cases of what can happen with the discriminant and how it can control the nature and the number of the roots of a quadratic as well as the x-intercepts of a parabola. So let's jump into those four cases. Now, I'm going to be presenting these cases in no particularly important order. So case one could have been case four, case two could have been case three, it doesn't really matter. Try your best not to memorize this, but try to really understand it in the context of the quadratic formula. So case number one is that the discriminant, which I'm going to call d, is a perfect square. And here's a good example of it. x squared plus 3x minus 10 equals 0. Well, let's figure out what the discriminant is. Let's see, that's going to be 3 squared minus 4 times 1 times negative 10. That's going to be 9 plus 40, and that's 49. And as we mentioned, that is a perfect square, right? We all should know what a perfect square is. Now, what are the roots? What are the actual solutions to that equation? Well, we don't need to work very hard at it at this point because we already know the number underneath the square root, 49. All right? So in fact, we should be able to get that very quickly. The square root of 49 is 7 divided by 2. So we'll have negative 3 minus 7 divided by 2. Let me work through that. That's negative 10 divided by 2, and that's negative 5. And then we'll have negative 3 plus 7 divided by 2, and that's going to be 4 divided by 2, and that's going to be 2. So here are your two roots. Well, what does it mean by the number and the nature? Well, the number of them is that there's two of them. And what are they? There are two unequal rational roots. In other words, these numbers are rational numbers. Remember, rational numbers are numbers that can be written as the ratio of integers. So that's negative 5 to 1, 2 to 1. In other words, they're not irrational numbers. right? So when the discriminant is a perfect square, you get the nicest, the nicest outcome. Your, your answers turn into rational numbers. As a side note, it also means, and this is kind of cool, that this could have been factored. You could have factored it, all right? And that's one of the nice things about the discriminant is it can tell you whether or not a quadratic expression can be factored or not. If it's a perfect square, it can be factored. If it's not a perfect square, it can't be. Or at least it can't be factored using rational numbers. All right. Pause the video now and write down anything you need to before we go on to case two. All right, clearing out the text and moving on to case two. All right, case two is that the discriminant is not a perfect square. All right, not a perfect square. And again, this time I'd like you to pause the video and calculate the discriminant. All right. 
So in this case, what we end up having is we end up having negative 6 squared minus 4 times 1 times 7, which ends up being 36 minus 28, which ends up being 8. Now, 8's a perfectly good number, you know, I mean, there's nothing wrong with it, but it's not a perfect square, right? It's not 4, it's not 9, it's not 1, it's not 25 or 16, any of those numbers. So let's work through the roots now. x is going to be negative b, which is positive 6, plus or minus the square root of 8, divided by 2. Now notice right away this is going to turn out to be not nearly as nice as it was before, because when we quote, simplify the square root of 8, and I'm not going to walk you through that procedure, you've done that many times, it ends up being 2 times the square root of 2, divided by 2, and then when we distribute that division by 2, we get 3 plus or minus the square root of 2. Now anytime we have a rational number added to an irrational number, the result is always an irrational number. You looked at that a bit in Common Core Algebra 1. So in this case, the nature and the number are two unequal irrational roots. They're still real numbers, right? They're still real numbers. I mean, they're not nice. 3 plus the square root of 2 is one of them, and 3 minus the square root of 2 is the other one, but they're still real right? It would still mean we'd have x-intercepts, right? Think about that last lesson, right? The discriminant is still positive, so we would still have x-intercepts, but they would be a little bit messier numbers, all right? And that's case two. So pause the video now for a moment. All right, let's clear out the text and take a look at case three. Now this is one of my favorite ones. Sometimes the discriminant turns out to be zero, like literally zero, all right? Now it's a little bit silly to uh, actually calculate the discriminant here, but let's do it together and verify that it does end up being zero, right? So we'll have b squared, which is negative 10 squared, minus four times a times c, right? And that's going to be 100 minus 100, which ends up being the promised zero. All right, so the discriminant's all equal to zero. Now, what does that mean about the roots? Well, if we use the quadratic formula, we'd have negative b plus or minus the square root of zero divided by two times one, which would be, well, the square root of zero is zero. But what's weird about this is that we'd have 10 plus zero divided by two, which would be 10 divided by two, which would be five, and we would have 10 minus 0 divided by 2, which would be 10 divided by 2, which would be 5. So we get a 5, and we get another 5. Well, all right. Now, when mathematicians talk about this scenario, all right, and this is to me one of the coolest scenarios that occurs with the discriminant, they describe it in one of two ways, both of which are perfectly good. Sometimes they'll say that you have two equal rational roots, two equal rational roots, five and five, you know, or equally as good, one double rational root. One double rational root. And it kind of makes sense why they call it a double. In fact, if you actually use the zero product law instead of the quadratic formula on here, this is the way it would factor. I want you to take a look at that for a minute before we move on, right? x minus 5 times x minus 5. You know, setting each of those factors equal to zero gives you x equals 5 and x equals 5. Calling it a double root is really a nice way of calling it. Right, or a nice name for it, because the 5 shows up twice. Um, and they will always then be rational numbers in that case. Okay? So, very unique. 0 is very unique. Adding it, subtracting it makes no difference. So, pause the video now and write down anything you need to before we go on to case 4. All right, let me clear this out. 
The final case is simply one that we played around in, with in the last, last lesson. The discriminant is less than zero. In other words, the discriminant is negative. All right. So let, let's take a look at this one. In this case, we've got negative 8 squared minus 4 times 1 times 20, which would be 64 minus 80, which would be negative 16. So we've got a discriminant that's negative. Let's go through the roots. x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of negative 16, right? All divided by 2, which would be 8 plus or minus 4i divided by 2, which if we simplify would be 4 plus or minus 2i. All right. The nature and the number. Well, in this case, we've got two roots that are unequal and imaginary. Two unequal imaginary roots. All right. And that should be the easiest one to understand, right? Because it's, it's a scenario where the discriminant is negative and therefore it introduces this imaginary component to it. All the other cases, we don't have an I come into play, right? Because the discriminant is either positive and a perfect square or positive and not a perfect square or zero. But when the discriminant is negative, that's when we get those two imaginary roots. And yeah, they happen to be unequal. All right. So pause the video now, and then we'll play around with this a little bit more on the back side of the sheet. All right, let me clear out the text. And let's go to page two. Now exercise two says, by using only the discriminant, determine the number and nature of the roots of each of the following quadratics. So all we want to do in this problem is we want to calculate b squared minus 4ac, only b squared minus 4ac. We don't even want to bring the square root in. And then based on that, we want to figure out which of those four scenarios it is. Now, don't just write down, you know, case one, case two, case three, case four. Really write out, you know, the description. And let, let's do the first one together. So let's calculate b squared minus 4ac here. So that's going to be 7 squared minus 4 times 2 times negative 4. And that ends up being 49 plus 832. And that gives me 81. All right, there's my discriminant. Now, remember, that's the thing that's going to be underneath that square root. And because 81's a perfect square, and because it's positive, this means that we will have two unequal rational roots. So that's what we mean by the nature and the number of the roots. Two unequal rational roots. So what I'd like you to do now is pause the video figure out what the discriminant's value is for the remaining five, and then think about what that means in terms of the roots of these quadratics. Pause the video now. This will take you a little bit of time, maybe even up to 10 minutes, okay? Okay, let's go through them. Letter B. B squared minus 4AC. Uh, let's see, negative 8 squared minus 4 times a times c. I'm going through the calculations here a little bit more. You might put this all into your calculator at once. That's fine. I get 64 minus 100, and that would give me negative 36. And it's all about that negative. Who cares that 36 is a perfect square? The plain fact is because the discriminant is negative, we're going to have two unequal imaginary roots. Two unequal imaginary roots. Let's take a look at letter C. B squared minus 4AC. We're going to have 4 squared minus 4 times 4, lots of 4s in this problem, times 1. It gives me 16 minus 16 gives me a discriminant of 0. So two different ways of saying this. You could say you have two equal rational roots, 
or it is completely acceptable, in fact, more than acceptable, to say that you have one double rational root. One double rational root. Sorry about the poor handwriting on that. Not the greatest. All right, let's take a look at letter D. All right. B squared minus 4AC. That's going to be 6 squared minus 4 times 1 times 15. That's going to be 36 minus 60, and that's going to be negative 24. And again, all that really matters is that the discriminant is negative in this case. So that's going to give us our two, whoops, unequal imaginary roots. All right. Whew. Let's look at E. B squared minus 4ac. It takes me more time to do the writing than the thinking. All right, we're going to have negative 4 squared minus 4 times 4 times negative 7. That's going to be 16 plus 112, and that's 128. Now watch out when the numbers get kind of large like this. 128 happens to not be a perfect square, but if you get some really large numbers, you may not know whether they're perfect squares or not. Feel free, obviously, to put them under the square root on your calculator to check that out. But this is not a perfect square, and because of that, what we end up having is two unequal irrational roots. All right. In other words, our final answer would include square roots that can't be simplified any further. Okay, we'd have an irrational component to our answer. Doesn't mean it's not real. Certainly continues to be real. Just irrational. All right, let's take a look at letter F. All right, let's see. B squared minus 4AC gives me negative 7 squared minus 4 times 3 times 2. That almost looks like a 2. <laughs> 49 minus, let's see, 4 times 3 is 12, 24, 25. All right. I love it when they turn out this way because that means that it has two unequal rational roots, right? 25 is a nice perfect square. Two unequal rational roots. All right, the nature and the number. Now, just as a fair warning, some students will tend to, you know, write these out, memorize, memorize, memorize them, and I, you know, I mean, I can, I can understand that, you know. Um, the different types of numbers, rational versus irrational versus imaginary, all of that, that can be quite challenging. But Really, I urge you to understand the idea that the discriminant is that number underneath the square root. And because of that, that number then dictates how the answers play out. Are they rational numbers? Are they irrational numbers? Are they imaginary numbers because the discriminant is a negative? Or are, they, are the two roots the same because we end up with a zero underneath there? All right, speaking of that one, we're going to explore that a little bit more in the next exercise. Pause the video now, though, and write down anything that you might need to. All right. Well, let's clear this out and maybe make my head a little bit bigger. Um, so much writing, so little time. All right. Consider the quadratic function, whose equation is y equals x squared minus 4x plus 4. Determine the number of x-intercepts of this quadratic from the value of its discriminant. Then sketch its graph on the axes given we say that this parabola is tangent to the x-axis. So let's, let's take a look at this, right? In order to find the x-intercepts, which are the same thing as the zeros and the roots, right? we would be looking to solve this. But it just says determine the number of x-intercepts. Well, to figure out the number of x-intercepts, all we really need Whoops, <laughs> don't want to set that equal to zero. That's a little bit weird. Um, all we really need to know is the value of the discriminant. But let's take a look at that together. So we have b squared, which is negative 4 squared, minus 4 times a times c, which is 16 minus 16, which is zero. Got a little bit ahead of myself. 
Now remember, that means that we have only one double root. One double root. So how does that play out in the way that the parabola looks? Well, what I'd like you to do is take your graph and calculator right now and use it to graph that parabola with the window indica indicated by the axes. Pause the video now and take a look. All right. Well, this is really cool because when the discriminant is equal to zero, what the parabola does is it dips down and it doesn't cross the x-axis, but it does touch it. And it touches it only once. Now, you might remember from geometry that when you have a circle and you have a line that just touches the circle and then glances off of it, we call that a tangent. Well, it's the same idea here, right? The parabola is tangent to the x-axis. It just touches it, grazes it, and then it comes back up. And of course, you can have parabolas that are tangent to the x-axis like that, and you can have parabolas that are tangent to the x-axis like that, right? And that's what it looks like when the discriminant is equal to zero, all right? When the discriminant is negative, right, it won't touch the x-axis at all. It'll go like that or it'll go like that. When the discriminant is positive, it'll touch the x-axis twice, like that and that, okay? But when the discriminant is equal to zero, it will just come down, hit the x-axis, and then go back up, or vice versa if it's a parabola that opens downward. All right, pause the video now and write down anything you need to. Okay, I'm going to clear out the text. Let's move on to some multiple choice questions. So, you know, this one, which of the following parabolas has two unequal rational x-intercepts? All right. So what did the discriminant have to look like in order for the x-intercepts or the zeros to be unequal and rational numbers? Pause the video and think about that for a minute. All right. Well, to have two unequal rational x-intercepts, the discriminant, b squared minus 4ac, must be a perfect square. So what I'd like you to do is calculate the discriminant for each one of those until you find one where it has a perfect square discriminant. All right, well, it turns out that it's choice number two. In fact, if you calculate the discriminant on choice two, b squared minus 4ac, not b squared minus 4cc, uh, we would get two squared minus 4 times 1 times negative 15, which would be 4 plus 60, which is 64. And because 64 is a perfect square, the x-intercepts have to be different, and they have to be rational numbers. All right? Pause the video now if you need to. Okay, let's clear this out. And let's tackle probably the most challenging problem. Exercise 5 says, for what values of a will the parabola y equals ax squared plus 4x plus 2 not cross the x-axis? Not cross the x-axis. In other words, for what values of a will the parabola either look like this or look like this, right? That's what we want. Well, this is pretty challenging. All right, think about what must be true about the discriminant first for it not to cross the x-axis. Pause the video and think about this for a moment. All right, well, in order for a parabola not to cross the x-axis, as we saw even as early as the last lesson, the discriminant must be negative. All right, so in other words, b squared minus 4ac must be less than 0. So in this case, what we're going to be doing is we're going to be solving an inequality. All right, notice it's asking us for the values of a. So let's take a look. Well, we'd have 4 squared minus 4 times a, well, a is a, times c, which is 2. That would all have to be less than 0. 
Well, 4 squared is 16, and then 4 times 2 is 8. So I'd have 16 minus 8a must be less than 0. Now I just have to solve this. All right. Now this is a nice linear inequality, so I don't have to do anything all that tricky. I'll just subtract 16 from both sides. So ne negative 8a would be less than negative 16. And then I have to divide by negative 8 on both sides. But we need to be careful, because remember, when dividing by a negative, what that forces me to do is switch the inequality. And this is really neat. What we find is that for any value of a greater than 2, so a is 2.1, a is 3, a is 15, this parabola will not cross the x-axis. And I would encourage you to actually grab one where a is bigger than 2. You know, and 3 is a great example. If you actually graph this, 3x squared plus 4x plus 2, you'll find that it does not cross the x-axis. On the other hand, right, so we would have something that probably looked like, like this. On the other hand, if I chose a value of a that was less than 2, like 1, x squared plus 4x plus 2, then we would find that it would cross the x-axis. All right, that's kind of neat. Okay. So pause the video now, and then we'll finish up the lesson. Okay, clearing out the text. All right, so in this lesson, we really examined the discriminant of a quadratic, the b squared minus 4ac. And we saw how its value really kind of broke down into four different cases. You know, it could be a positive perfect square. It could be positive but not a perfect square. It could be equal to zero, and it could be negative. And each one of these scenarios, and I'm not going to review them all right now, will then dictate what's known as the nature and the number of the roots. Are they rational? Are they irrational? Are they complex? Do they have an imaginary component, etc.? All right. So I want to thank you for joining me for another Common Core Algebra 2 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until next time, keep thinking and keep solving problems.